on issues and matters that are concerned to you, the Guyanese people, every Thursday right here between 12.30 and 1.30 every Thursday on Channel 6. And as always, I always remind you of the numbers to call in, 225-0010 and 225-0008. And we'll take calls after 1 o'clock. And as usual, I always remind you too about the Office of the Leader of Opposition is open, 304 Church Street between New Market, New Garden and uh, Peter Rose Street. And we're open from 9 to, to 5 in the afternoon, Monday to Friday, and on Saturdays from about 9.30 to 1.30. So please feel free if you have issues you wish to raise, you wish to uh, have representation, advice, we're there to serve you and different members of parliament and staff are there to work with you. We welcome anybody regardless of whether they voted for us or not. We're here to serve the Guyanese people as a voluntary opposition. And remind you that there's Freedom Radio that you can listen to uh, on Demerara 91.1, Burbeast 90.5, and 90.7 Essequibo. Well, today we're going to focus on a couple of things that happened in the last week. The arrest of the PDP leaders by SOPU, the Serious Organized Crime Unit, and yet another drug scandal of 600 odd million dollars and the latest on the continuing saga of the contract and the parking meters in Georgetown. Well, since we last met, there have been many happenings, some of which you may know about. Um, I missed you last week due to Parliament, the Parliament sitting on the same day with four large controversial bills, the Hamilton Green Pension Bill, the Civil Aviation Bill, the much-anticipated State Asset Recovery Bill, and the Commercial and Deeds Registry Amendment Bill. To most people's surprise, the government deferred the state's assets recovery bill, and we believe they will come with that in the next sitting on April the 13th. But they did pass the very controversial Hamilton Green pension bill in spite of opposition, not only from the parliamentary opposition, but by many individuals and civil society organizations. A number of lawyers also have jointly approached the court with regard to the commercial and deeds registry amendment bill, and the court has ordered that the minister proceed to appoint the board, which uh, the minister has refused to appoint for months and months and months, and was bringing an amendment to the bill to give him powers over the deeds and commercial registries were the board not to be functioning. And so the court has ruled that he must do so, must go ahead and appoint the board. But the really big happening last week was, it was the arrest of former President Barry Jack Dale, former head of the Presidential Secretary Dr. Roger Luncheon, former Prime Minister Sam Hines, former Ministers Priya Manikchan, N.K. Gopal, Robert Passard, Clement Rohi, uh, the daughter of former President Donald Ramatar, Elizabeth Ramatar, the Director of Public Prosecutions, uh, the, one of the leading members of the private sector, Ramesh Duku, Kwame McCoy, who is a former advisor to the President, uh, President Jack Dio and President Ramana, Ramatar, with regards to the uh, press relations, and Gina in particular. And so all of these took place on March the 7th and March the 8th. In fact, the former President Jack Dio has presidential immunities even after demitting office, and so he should not have been arrested. It was all meant to humiliate and embarrass the leader of opposition. Last weekend, uh, interestingly enough, President Granger publicly stated it should not have happened. So who is in charge of the operation then? Who's running the show? Do you know? But so let's go back a little bit because what was all that about? And, and let's go back a bit. You know, when the PVP Civic um, decided to have a national housing program, it was under Dr. Teddy Jagan's presidency and no low-income houses had been built in Ghana for over 10 years. There was, you know, people could not afford to buy houses or to buy land. And so around 94, 95, we took a decision to, to launch a national housing program. And it was based on a policy that knowingly and wittingly sold state land at subsidized prices for low-income housing for the use of individual uh, house lots for low-income households, and later with the development of the uh, middle-income housing programs that attach to each of the large schemes. 
Land given to private developers, however, could not obtain land at subsidized prices for private housing schemes. So it was a clear policy that it was in place for over 20 years, never challenged in court, never opposed, never exposed, never thought to be a corrupt act or any allegation of any wrongdoing. And remember, too, that the lands as they were opened up one after the other, the, the land in Diamond, the land at Tushan, the land at Parfait Harmony, the land at Nonpareil on East Coast, for example, and, and Strat um, Stratsby and so on. These were all unoccupied lands, many times abandoned sugar lands, um, totally underdeveloped with no water, electricity, house, uh, roads, drainage, all of this had to be put in. And so these were not lands that were developed and therefore were calling for large prices. These were lands that were unoccupied, unutilized, and available to provide housing for low-income people and for middle-income people as well. So the APNO AFC have been ratcheting up their accusations against Mr. Jagdu and the PUP leaders since the 2011 elections and during the period leading up to the 2015 elections. And more so having got into power, they massaged repeatedly with the help of some of the hostile state media that the land at Sparendam, or what became popularly called in the media, Proudville II, was sold to Jagdo and other um, former cabinet members, public officials and private individuals before below the market value. And they threatened to charge Jagdo and the others for corruption for fraud. In fact, there is no crime or offense committed if you buy the land below the market value. The burden is on the accuser to prove that there was something illegal, corrupt, fraudulent about the manner in which the sale took place. But the fact is that as a policy of a government to have subsidized land in government housing schemes, that cannot be challenged. It cannot be challenged. And if they proceed down this road, which they appear to be proceeding down this road, because it's an absolutely ridiculous charge, then does that mean that they could apply this to all the persons, all the families who have bought house lots and built houses in government housing schemes right across this country? Because all those lands were bought at subsidized prices from the time it started in 1996 right up to 2015. And so all that land was not sold at market value, but was subsidized and sold below market value. Then we have uh, SARU, the State Assets Recovery Unit, headed by Dr. Clive Thomas. And the several political appointees there in that unit include, you may know, an ex-GDF uh, officer, uh, Rhett Meyer, Desmond Trotman, who was, a, who was a former AFC MP, Eric Phillips, actor, and obviously he has always stuck with the PNC from old days, and now a presidential advisor and working in the SARO. All of these have contributed to the fuel around the fire of Spiron Dam. These manufacturers of fake news, to borrow President Trump's term, are obsessed in the face of growing popular expression against impositions of their lives. Instead, uh, they work to ref reflect with a special machinery, mindlessly trying to confuse people as if, they, as if they, they wish to warn that if the APNO AFC coalition is not re-elected and not in power, the wicked PPPC will come back in. And so the spin doctors and the fake news manufacturers are all busy trying to create a hype in other words, to show that the PPP was wicked. If one checks the Ministry of Finance website, you will find 36 audit reports posted starting from February 2016 to the most recent in February 2017, which the AP and UFC government commissioned when they got into office. These uh, audit reports, by the way, cost hundreds of millions of dollars, and they did not, uh, the, the choice, the selection of those who did the audits did not go through a procurement process. These were all hand-picked persons to do the audits. So they set it up well. These special and forensic audit reports, as I said, were supposed to find $30 billion. The APNU AFC coalition told the people during the 2015 election campaign that the PVP members had stolen. 
In 36 audits, they have uncovered less than 70,000 US dollars, which they claim was misappropriated. In fact, in one case, monies were repaid since 2016, and this was the case of the CEO of GoInvest who had repaid money that he had used for his own personal purposes, 2 point something million Ghana dollars. So where's the 30 billion they claimed that we had stolen? <clears throat> Yet, you know, the Saru head continues to make outrageous claims that he can't substantiate. He says 300 billion was stolen from the economy annually under the PPC. But the economy is only a 600 billion dollar one. So, how did the country have money to provide basic services to people if this Wild West claim was in fact true? And one must ask the government if they are so clean and they've stopped the hemorrhaging of $300 billion per annum, let them show us what they were doing, what they're doing with this new windfall of additional $300 billion. Because this is very confusing. You know, they have brought enormous budgets, Yet they have taxed the Guyanese people more than at any other time in our history as a nation. And then, of course, on top of that, they're now saying they have to have cost saving. So it was recycle envelopes. Well, <laughs> if anybody knew Teddy Jagan and Freedom House, we've been recycling envelopes and paper <laughs> since the 1960s and 70s. So, and we carry that into government. Uh, so, um, and. It helps to save paper, it helps to save the trees, but it's not necessarily a great cost-saving venture. And maybe one of the things the government may want to think about if they wish to save money is to reduce their salaries back, at, back to what they were in May 2015. And that would save almost a billion dollars to the taxpayers between now and the next elections. Remember too that, uh, just remember that Saru has no legal basis and therefore is acting outside, outside the law when it takes a businessman into the Ministry of the Presidency to question him about his taxes and tax concessions. This is the role of the Guyana Revenue Authority and not Saru. But in the new law, State's Asset Recovery Bill, which we are all opposed to, not only the PPP but uh, many uh, persons in the private sector, lawyers, civil society people and individuals, because in this bill, the director of SARU will assume and can assume the powers and will have superior powers of the police, immigration, prosecution, commissioner general, for example. So all of this is the context within which we lead up to March the 7th. And so before we get there, we then read um, in the headlines that Soku was now heading the investigations into these allegations of corruption where, which the, the forensic audits did not find. And these were, now you have to remember that the Serious Organized Crime Unit was created to assist the Financial Intelligence Unit in investigating money laundering and countering the financing of terrorism. And this unit falls under the Ghana Police Force and governed by the Police Act and police rules, etc. So this is a legal entity, it has legal powers. But why would Soku be investigating acquisition of land at Prado 2 when it has nothing to do with money laundering and financing terrorism? And, and certainly no one, no one in government or anywhere else has made such a link in and made such an accusation to do with money laundering and Prado 2. Remember in December 2015, the use of Soku and the GDF in the terrible chase of young MP Ramson's wife and brother-in-law, which led to three people losing their lives. To date, no one has taken any responsibility for, for whoever gave the orders to those officers who gave chase on that day. No commission inquiry, on, on, uh, uh, unlike the president who likes to have commission inquiries all the time. This was certainly one that he did not wish to have a COI of. We also ask, um, how do we know about Soku investigating in Prado to land? How do we know? Firstly, the government announced it would be hiring special prosecutors to go after members of the former government during the budget 2017 bu debate. They put millions into this to hire uh, special prosecutors. This information was shared by 
Minister Harmon when we were examining the estimates for the Ministry of the Presidency. Then Minister Ramjitan, who was also, when it came to his estimate, also pointed out they would be arresting and charging uh, former members of the PVPC administration and uh, charging them, arresting and charging them. Now, so that's what happened up to December 2016. But in, just shortly after that, there appears a new actor, one unknown to us in Guyana, including the PVPC, a Dr. Sam Sittleton, Sittlington, who is said to be the advisor to the SUPU and paid for by the British High Commission. I believe this may be the British High Commission's discretionary funds. This gentleman in February this year made statements, a number of very uh, leading statements in the media about one of the number of investigations that SOKU was handling, their capacity to handle it, what were some of the investigations and what, what they were looking for. And so, and this included reference to Nissel and Prado too. And in one of the articles points to the Minister of Housing, the then Minister of Housing, as being solely responsible. The question what was asked, but what was an advisor doing commenting on an active investigation? Clearly he was involved in operational issues. If he was there as a technical person, training and studying the law and looking for, you know, create protocols and uh, standing operating procedures, one can understand. But this gentleman was in the press, in the face of the press, being very outspoken about what Soku was dealing with, and generally by security forces and by police and intelligence agencies and stuff. They tend not to comment on what are active investigations going on. They're very, very cautious until they actually feel that they've got enough material they can actually charge people. Furthermore, this gentleman was involved with Soku on raiding parties where he was in the premises when they entered and, and he went into premises of Guyanese nationals. He accompanied the head of Soku, Mr. James, on Friday, March the 3rd to Freedom House to meet with Dr. Luncheon, who was in a meeting. He then also accompanied the head of Soku to the office of the leader of the opposition on Tuesday, March the 7th to arrest former president, Mayor Jack Dale. So he accompanied Mr. James. He was there at the office, and he drove Mr. James to, uh, to arrest Mr. Jack Dale. And most telling, after the arrest and the questioning of all these different people on Tuesday and Wednesday, the boys in Soku, the Minister of Public Security, Ram Jatan, accompanied with the same gentleman, accompanied by the same gentleman, and the British High Commissioner, and staff of the British High Commission apparently went to have an evening of merriment, or what is being called now as the wine party in the, at the OAS, uh, o Oasis, Oasis, to celebrate their good works and to say farewell to Mr. Sittington. The PPP exposed this and the British High Commission reacted immediately with a press release denying that they were there and denying that Sittington was involved in operational matters of SOKU. The glaring contradiction between what the British High Commissioner has said in relation to the involvement of staff from the British High Commission in Guyana in the operations of the Special Organized Crime Unit and the Wine Party held after top People's Progressive Party leaders were arrested, detained, and then released has been exposed on multiple occasions by none other than the Minister of Public Security, Kemraj Ramjitan. The High Commissioner said that no staffer from the British High Commission was involved in the wine drinking after the arrest. But Ramjitan has admitted that Sidlington, a staffer of the British High Commission, was at the wine party. On Saturday at a fundraising dinner, Mr. Ramjitan said, and I quote him, the fact is that I had some wine with Sam, Sam Sidlington, on Wednesday evening at Oasis was because I wanted to thank him for the great work he did at Soku. The British High Commission has been silent regarding the, the fact that a statement he released on the wine party was proven to be an untruth 
by the government minister who was involved. So the mystery question is, what was Sittingson's role in the Soku? And that was this condoned by the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the UK and or the government of Guyana? As the leader of opposition has gone on record calling for the setting up of a commission inquiry into the matter of Sittlington's operational involvement in Soko. Knowing President David Jagan's proclivity, Granger's proclivity for setting up commissions of inquiry and his military background, especially as relates to foreign interference in the internal affairs of our country, one would expect him to set up a commission inquiry. So let, we'll see what he is going to do. The manufacturers of fake news or alternative facts have gone into overdrive. As I said, the audits have found nothing of consequence, so how do they justify the lies they told the people at the elections? Well, they have to create new lies, more fake news to support the lies they've told earlier. We have exposed scandal after scandal, violation of procur procurement procedures by this government, and there's no letting up. We have gone through 26 scandals, which I have documented to you. Some of the 26 I have I exposed right here on this program in August 2016. Some of these have developed sequels or chapters. They're not finished. There are new components to them that keep coming forward. The corruption continues. So if you look at Durban Park, as recent as December 2015, budget debate, half a million being put to the Durban Park. Then we, we have the Republic, and we see more works going on at Durban Park. Any procurement? Were the advertisement? Was this tended for? Where did this come from? Was this in the budget? No, it wasn't. So we have the sequels of Durban Park. The parking meters contract keeps evolving into uh, an, uh, a saga of such ineptitude and corruption that it stinks to high heaven. So that one isn't over yet, although we started putting it in the 26 scandals when the first thing was signed in May 2015. Yet right under their noses, and oh, you have also procurement of drugs and medical supplies. And we'll come back to that one. And of course, there are new ones brewing as we speak. Yet under their noses, 26 scandals, including, as I said, Durban Park, parking meters, write-offs of five billion to DDL, the Sussex Street bond, violation of procurement laws, and selecting contractors for huge sums of money with no tender or no bidding processes. All this is going under their noses and in their domain, and they have done nothing to stop it. No one has been investigated, charged or otherwise. And so, whilst all the talk about getting to the former PPP uh, cabinet and government members and officials, what is the government doing about keeping its house clean? These scandals, the 26 scandals and more, are enormous proportions. And it continues, and let me just give you an example of the subtlety of what's happening. The government has got into the habit of putting out tenders in the media and then cancelling them repeatedly. So this is going on in, in various ministries. So you see ads being advertised for services or contracts and then they're cancelled. Then they come up a bit later, another one and a third one. And the problem appears to be that when the tenders go out and people bid for them, and there's an evaluation process, and it doesn't look, at, or it isn't that their contractor will win, their, 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 their chosen contractor will win, then they cancel the contract, cancel the bid, and start all over again. And so we're seeing this go on over and over again. So it can't be one minister, one agency, you know, playing the fool and, and being corrupt. This is a pattern, a trend that's taking place right across the government. So, you want some examples? The water treatment plants. Those were canceled, canceled, and canceled. The GPL prepaid meters, canceled three times. 
delayed nine times, nine months. This was an IDB project. They were taken to court by one of the, the bidders that they were unfairly treated and that the bidder who won price was $1 billion over the estimate for the tender. Matter went to the court and lo and behold, the matter is rushed through and the contract, the court allows the contract to proceed, costing us, the Guyanese people, $1 billion more from the estimated price after nine months delay, and in which this also meant that uh, project funds was not being released as it's supposed to be, therefore leading to decline in foreign currency, decline in jobs for people, decline in economic activities for people. So it's not just about the corruption thing. It has layers of, of impact and, and repercussions right across the country. The Sherry Street Road project has been postponed, uh, uh, advertised and postponed several times. And then of course, the latest one, $600 million to a Trinidadian company, Ansel Macau for drugs badly needed at public hospital Georgetown. But this came after public hospital Georgetown advertised three times for drugs and medical supplies last year, in the latter part of last year. And each time called them up, cancel it. Three occasions they called it up. So then they say that there was this emergency for drugs. Well, you know, we have been pointing out that there's been a drug shortage in Guyana that started, we noticed it around December 2015, January 2016. We've been arguing about it in Parliament, raising it in Parliament, raising it under the estimates of 2016, the 2017. We brought a motion on it, they denied, and then Dr. Norton said, no, 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 we were talking nonsense, there's no drug shortage. Well, today in the papers, he accepts that he didn't tell the truth, there was a drug shortage, there is a drug shortage. So we're not always wrong about everything, are we? So here we have a ministry that usually spends billions of dollars on drugs because we are one of the few countries remaining in the region that provide free health care at the clinics, the district hospitals, regional hospitals, and Georgetown Public Hospital. All our immunization, our antenatal clinics, our diabetic clinics, our non-communicable disease clinics, our postnatal clinics, these are all free. And we have been purchasing drugs for years. And I can tell you, I was a Minister of Health from the World Health Organization Clearinghouse at far cheaper prices. We were buying from UNICEF far cheaper prices. And we've been also been buying from those agencies that are not for profit or who are not um, providing drugs, basic uh, health care drugs for maternal and child health, especially in the days when we really had no money at all in the early 90s. And so what developed over time was what was called a pre-qualification because the, the volume was so large of drugs and medical supplies, whether it is gloves, whether it is instruments needed in surgery, whether it's syringes, whether it's in needles and so on, the health sector has a lot of supplies and it uses them and because of disease and HIV AIDS, things aren't recycled. You throw away things now. So you don't like in the, in the 70s, you reuse needles. You can't do that now. Everything has to be new and sterilized and brand new. So that Companies had to be pre-qualified and then were put, once they were pre-qualified, they were then requested to provide required drugs. New GPC was one of those companies that pre-qualified, a local company that produced drugs here, that also had patents from other developing countries that have been approved by the World Health Organization and other international bodies, have been used here so that we were saving money. That is why when we, we can have immunization in this country that costs far less than the United States, far, far less. And our children are immunized 
and we have far higher levels of immunization than the United States. Because the way in which we purchase the drugs and the, the suppliers, the manufacturers where we buy them from as a, as a developing country. So unfortunately, Ansel Merkel did not pre-qualify because Ansel Merkel buys very expensive drugs, mainly Fisher, for example, which are very expensive drugs, which most developing countries can't afford unless you're offering them in the private health sector. But in the public health sector, they usually tend to use generic drugs um, that, that are cheaper. And so, lo and behold, 600 odd million dollars has been given to a company that is costing us far more for every single item, every single item, every single item. And you know who's gonna be paying the drug bill, don't you? You and me and all the Guyanese taxpayers are now paying much more for the drugs that are going to be imported from this company. Now, when this scandal was exposed over the last few days, one had the usual fake news manufacturers from the government and minister explaining that there was an emergency. They needed drugs and they just had to go to the company as that company would bring in right away and that um, so on. They also added that it was good that this company that wasn't given a chance under the PUP government now was getting an opportunity to provide drugs to, drugs to Guyana. The company, as I said, did not succeed in being pre-qualified prior to 2015 because of the extraordinary high cost of drugs that they were offering. When this was exposed, the minister, this is the new Minister of Health, by the way, then turned and blamed the staff of the Ministry of Health. No one takes responsibility in the government whatsoever for anything. So the Ministry of Health staff are now blamed for what? For not telling them there was an emergency or problem with drugs? Is the Ministry of Health staff or the public hospital staff the ones who cancel the tenders? So this whole thing of blaming the staff now, the, the staff were not giving them the right information. Well, come off of it, Ms. Minister Valga Lawrence. You moved your office from Brick Dam to the Bond at Diamond. Your office is right in the Bond. So you can take a walk every now and again. It's a very big Bond. You can have a little exercise to, to manage you know, all your weight and everything else, as we all do as women. Have a little walk, good for the heart, and talk to the staff and examine the records and take an interest. Isn't that why you said you were moving your office to the bond, the drug bond in Diamond, in order to keep an eye on what was going on and to make sure that drugs were coming in the country and that the staff were doing what they're supposed to do. Now, two months after you've gone there, almost three months, now you're blaming the staff. Well, what were you doing in your office? at the drug bond. I mean, I don't know why a Minister of Health would have their office in a drug bond and not be in the center of the city where they can meet people and they can be accessible to the people who elected you. But let's leave that for now. Let's take what she said as the truth. She wanted to be there to monitor and make sure that drugs were coming in and so on and so forth. Well, what happened? What happened? Now you turn and blame the Ministry of staff you blame the material management unit, you blame the public hospital staff, unbelievable and unconscionable. You know, we have been, by the way, it is the public hospital that wrote the National Procurement Tender Administration, advising that they wanted to do sole sourcing from the company, Anson Macau, and that this was on the instructions of the minister, Valga Lawrence. So what has she got to say about that one? You know, we have been exposing the dire state of drugs and medical supplies for such a long time, you know, and yet tenders and procurement of these life-saving necessities can be ordered, can be timely, can be done in an organized way, can be brought in at reasonable prices, in competitive prices, 
in a timely fashion to make sure that we have supplies to run the public health system of our country, to make sure that when people go to clinics and hospital, they're being treated properly and they're getting the best that we can offer as a country. And so it's all about payback time. And what do I mean by that? Payback time, the, the government has this retribution and revenge and vengeance on the former cabinet members, former president, Jack Dale, and their special focus is always former president, Jack Dale. So it's payback time. You know, just as they said, is are we time? Fresh start? Well, now this, we're now in the payback time mode. One is to wreck retribution on the former ministers and cabinet members and PVP supporters. And also, it's payback time for their financiers. As one of the ministers said, these people who supported their election campaign invested in the coalition and therefore they must get back the rewards of their investment and so pay back time pay back time and so organizations and individuals we may not even have known or even suspected had financed the APNU AFC over one billion dollar election campaign well some of those are coming to light now aren't they well, parking meters. <laughs> Can't leave that one alone today either. More confusion. The government says they're recommendation, recommending, the government's recommending. From May 2016, this thing started. Calls went on and on and on. Stop this, stop this to the government. March the 15th, the government says. They are recommending a three month suspension. Smart City Solutions knows nothing about this, and they say to Harman, they have a contract with the city council, so forget you. <laughs> and Minister Patterson, <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing, please forgive me, suddenly wakes up to the fact that parking meters are illegally placed on certain roads. <laughs> this is so hilarious, it is sad because I noted on this program since September, October, calling on Minister Patterson and the police to get involved because roads and uh, motor traffic and vehicles and so on come under those entities, not under a parking meter contract. However, so the minister who's responsible for roads didn't notice that the parking meters have been in installed illegally on some roads. Can you imagine that? And they started putting in all the, the infrastructure for the parking meters since early November. I don't know where he's been for the last couple of months. But you know, maybe it's like the Minister of Culture who had a problem with uh, Pagwa. And so talked about Pagwa as a festival of lights. And so Guyanese with a typical imaginations and ingenuity went berserk on the social media saying that it's no longer Pagwa, it's Pagwali. So we have ministers like that who seem to be out to lunch somewhere, or maybe some of them are permanently out to lunch, and then we have others who are in Parliament who come at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock to Parliament who seem to have had quite a long um, wet lunch, is that how I would call it, who actually needed to have a breathalyzer, um, because we can't say certain things. Um, at least the police woke up that they were parking too close to the corner sometime in January. But <laughs> Minister Patterson woke up like yesterday. So lastly, I must have my last lick. Yesterday was the 104th anniversary of the Rose Hall Martyrs, where people lost their lives in the year um, 1913 on the Sugar Estate of Rose Hall. And so there was a commemoration activity uh, for that at which and the government hosted it, by the way. Can you imagine the, the feistiness of the government hosting an anniversary of where sugar workers were killed 
And that is the estate they're talking about closing down. <laughs> well, that's what they did. Yes, that's what they did. They went to Rose Hall and guess who spoke? Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu, not the president, not Mr. Harmon, Mr. Nagamutu. And they also threw in Minister Ramjatan for good luck as well. And so here they were at Rose Hall where the Nagamutu believes that he can mamagai people <laughs> with his words. And so can you imagine? He said, and it's in the papers today if you don't believe me, in Stavrick News, he says, we're not going to close sugar. Sugar will not die in Guyana. We're just going to close some factories. <laughs> we'll just close some factories. And you don't have to worry, sugar workers, um, because now instead of producing 50%, we'll be producing 100%. And so we'll be able to have the sugar from the estates, other estates come to uh, converge and we'll have greater production and we'll save money and the sugar workers will do better. Well, <laughs> you try that logic. Please read the article in the Starbuck News and see if you don't find it at least amusing or at least confusing because sugar will not die. But we happen to be closing quite a number of estates. What does he then think that the Wales, is, the people at Wales estate are stupid? They close Wales Estate. There's no work. Factory and field are closed. So there's no sugar being produced and being taken to Eiffel from Wales. They didn't cut, they didn't plant, they did nothing. So if you close Rose Hall, where's the sugar coming from? If you sell and privatize Skeldon, what's going to happen then? So read Minister Nagamutu's uh, the report on Minister Nagamutu's speech at Rose Hall and see if you find it as amusing, irritating, and sad as I do. And let me know. Well, as you know, I keep saying that, uh, I'll repeat it on this program, the government continues to live in some la-la land, believing that it can rule this country by diktat, lack of transparency, lack of accountability, subversion of the constitution and the judiciary, and happily, 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 go about rebranding, renaming, and repainting Guyana. Green, of course, as the president says. Green is cool. So, there's no one else to blame for all of this, except the APNU AFC coalition government. As the responsibility fell on the shoulders of the PPP, civic successive presidents, so too, the responsibility falls on the APNU president APNU AFC president, Mr. Geringer, and of course his psychic Prime Minister, Nagamutu. So we have serious problems in this country, the economy, foreign currency, business. The city is dying with this nonsense going on. And we, rec we hear about painting and changing names and commemorative activities and speeches, but none of that's making the economy work. None of that's providing jobs for our people. So let me open the floor. Let me open the phone, OK? So um, we'll hear you. We have some time. But there are serious things going on. And I thought I would raise those three issues with you today um, for you to think about, for you to think about. OK, first caller. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Yes, good afternoon to you. Yes, good afternoon. You know, it's a sad day that we still have to be arguing about the sugar estate. Yes. We know the sugar estate was not making money from ever long. And we took $200 million and decided to flow it into the Skellin estate. And at the date, the Skellin estate cannot function properly. It took $50 something million dollars and flowed into the, into the Marriott. And the Marriott cannot, um, the Marriott cannot function um, <laughs> Can be filled with, with, with customers right now. We waste money, we waste two, uh, at that day we waste 250 million US dollars, right? And now we're, we're harping about other things. Would you, I want to make an observation that um, if this, this, um, this, 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 this uh, judicial decision saying that it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional to decide that, that, they, that they, a president cannot run for more than two, more than two terms. You know, 
all other, all other constitutional amendments that were made will have to go down the same line, become unconstitutional because none were made through, through referendum. So that's a, that's a whole Pandora box that y'all are opening there and y'all got to be careful because right now Mr. Granger is going to decide to, to appoint your own, your own commissioner. Um, uh, um, oh, you know that for a fact. Because of the fact that, because of the fact that, um, that this, this present system was done through a constitutional reform, which was not done by a referendum. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. I'll answer the person who called in a while. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Hi, good, good afternoon, my madam. Good yes, morning. good afternoon. How are you? I'm good. Um, I think this is Tim Dam, the, the, the man who named Pop the Santa. Pagwali? Oh, Pagwali. Oh, the minister who. <laughs> she, it was a she, the minister of culture. Um. He said, yeah, um, I don't know, someone was supposed to take you out. He's a sick man. It's a she, not a he. It's a she, not a he. It's the Minister of Culture, Nicolette Henry. She's the one who's doing her master's degree at the expense of the Guyanese people. We're paying for that, by the way. So she doesn't know the difference between Pagwa and Diwali. He's on all the things. Yeah? Pagwa and Diwali, he won't put any old now. She just was not... Uh, I guess she didn't know anything about Pagwa or Diwali. Who knows? I don't know how you could be born in Guyana and you don't know about Pagwa and Diwali, but, you know. But anyway, I thought it was a mistake at first that it was no. someone playing a joke, but then I, I, I saw I, I, the report I and she did do it. In Pagwali. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Hello. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Matters of Public Importance. Good afternoon, Miss Dean. Hi, good afternoon. Nice to meet you again. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? I'm an MSK mom and I believe in the country soon. And I want the, the, the person who paid the money to kill my son, I want him to, to, to be in the jail too. You know? Uh huh. That is all I have to say. You don't know how a mother who has a son like MSK is grieving night and day. You I can imagine. That? I can no. I, 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 I dread every time when I think of my kids. I, I would dread anything to happen to them. So I, so I can imagine. To, I can I imagine how you feel. I want that son because he lives. He lives five years. Children. Uh -huh. I said the six-year-old mother to support. Yeah. You know that. Hmm. What father, how many fathers kill my son? Do they have children? Do they have grandchildren? You know? Yeah. So I want them to pick up the business and who paid that guy whether he the, the lock up or, or not. You gone to the I, police I complaints? To you gone to the police complaints authority? I, I tired complain everybody. You went everywhere? Yes, I went everywhere. I walked everywhere and I'm not seeing anything it's done about, about that case. Yeah. You know? My yeah. son can go th that way. Yeah, no, no I... They won't like their son. Something happened like that happened to, uh, to them. You know? No, of course not. All so, right then. Take care. So God is great and I got to get my... All of us have to die one day and go down to that earth. Yes, you know? yes. So let them enjoy his threat, his money and his property. I know all who have money for him. All right, Mrs. Dean, thank you for, okay. for listening to me. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye. Okay. Yeah, let me go back to the first caller. You said we wasted money on Skeldon. And then you said we wasted money on Marriott. So let me deal with Marriott first. Marriott is apparently the, after the government came in, they said he was going to be a prison and he was going to be a hospital. And now it's a favorite place for government to have its activities. And we're very pleased that they're enjoying it because it is a beautiful hotel. It has been doing good business. It has been doing well. And the chairman of the board is the minister of telecommunications. 
um, Minister Kathy Hughes. So I'm sure with the APNU in charge, they're according to their person, they won't lose any money at all in it. They're going to make money in it because that was what it could do. It can make money. It is a five-star hotel that we are pleased to have in our country, which we need to have in our country. And so um, I don't buy the one about Marriott whatsoever, and I don't know where the person got the view that it's not doing well because it's certainly doing better than a number of other places. The, the Skullin issue. You see, if you read Minister, what's his name, Prime Minister Nagamuchu today, you see he's talking about mechanization of the sugar industry and talking about um, that, you know, the sugar workers don't have to bend over and, and, and do all the very hard work in the sun to cut the cane that we should have harvesting. Well, Minister, Prime Minister Nagamuchu is about 10 years out. The issue of mechanization in the sugar fields started uh, sometime uh, earlier, in, in the pre-2011. And Skeldon, because of the production and so forth, this is a factory at a far higher level, faster, more modern, that would be able to increase productivity. The call of the person, the caller who called and said that sugar has been making money for years, I don't know where his information is coming from. Sugar has been making money for years. It started to go into a rough patch in more recent years. Not 10 years ago, not 15 years ago, not 20 years ago. In fact, 30 years ago, if it wasn't for sugar, I don't know where Guyana would have been. So too, even in the 90s. Sugar was a key factor that was bringing in money for the country and for all of us to pay for all of our benefits, our health and education and so forth. And so because rice had been practically destroyed under the PNC government. So that sugar, yes, is going through a difficult patch, but it's not impossible. And part of it has to do with the world, pri world, world prices, which affects gold, which affects bauxite, because bauxite's not doing well either. Timber, for example, and, and rice. The prices have changed. The prices are not good on the world market, and therefore it affects what we sell them for. When Trinidad says oil and the price of oil drops, Trinidad has problems. And so even in Trinidad, they had a lot of uh, foreign currency shortages uh, in the last uh, six months or whatever because the price of sugar, uh, price of oil had, f had fallen over the last year or two. And so where the person calling says that sugar has been not been making money for years is needs to get some sugar reports and to really see the information. Now look at the budget documents coming forward. Secondly, the factory was a good investment for another reason, not just because of producing cane, but also it produced cogeneration and was able to feed into the national grid to be able to provide electricity for burbies and reduce some of the strain on Demerara. And so cogeneration of what was uh, the, the waste from the cane has been used in an effective way for cogeneration. And so this is what uh, Gaisuko was paying for, and the government was had to pay back Gaisuko for some of those uh, the cogeneration component of the the Gaisuko. So it is not true that sugar was was a, a boon or a, a burden for for a long, long time. That's totally inaccurate, and therefore you have been reading information that is wrong, and maybe you should go and look at on your own. You don't want to believe me, but you want to believe other people. Fine. But go and look at the budget documents, and you'll see where the changes take place. And one of the big changes was when the preferential market for Europe fell out of the fell fell because European Union and others did wanted to have more competitive prices instead of giving preferential prices to the old countries that were former colonies. And so a lot of countries in Africa, Caribbean, and the Pacific who were former colonies and sugar producers had to now compete on the world market without the preferential market that was given to them by the European Union and by Europe and Britain. And that impacted on all of us and led to some countries stop producing sugar altogether in some places in the Caribbean. So anyway, we've got one minute left and I want to thank you for calling and I hope you found the program interesting. But you know, the government, as I keep saying, has to address the real issues, the big issues that Guyanese want answers to. Jobs investments. We want job creation, not job contraction. We want to be able to work and live in dignity and to be able to plan our lives 
and to save and build up for houses, cars or motorcycles, send our children to whichever school we want to and let them have a future to be able to get trained in whatever they want to. That's the hope of all of us as Guyanese. We're no different. And so it is time now to wind down the program and I wish to wish you all the best for the weekend and have a lovely week and that um, we'll catch up next Thursday as always 12.30 to 1.30. Um, Parliament is meeting like once a month this year since the year started so we won't be having Parliament till April the 13th on Monday Thursday which is a problem but anyway. Um, so I'll be here, I'll be here next Thursday to talk to you and, and to be able to raise issues of importance. And remember what I tell you all the time, please don't drink and drive, please don't. Stay safe, stay with your loved ones, enjoy your time with each other. Um, read, study, catch up on what's going on. If you don't believe what I say, go on the, the net and look at some of the statistics and information that's available out there, you know, and you'll see. You see that what I'm saying has a lot of merit. Okay, so have a great week, and we'll see you back next Thursday at 12.30, uh, right here on Channel 6, Matters of Public Importance. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye. Ta-ta. Is this a spare mic? Yeah. Or is this my regular mic? Yeah, that's Oh, there's the spare. This is my I regular like mic.